Hello there, you're watching Debrief on CNN News 18. I'm Maha Siddiqui. Taliban is rampaging through Afghanistan, taking over rural areas, provincial capitals and inching closer towards bigger urban centers. The situation is fast spiraling out of control as they take over critical assets as well as key border points. India has sent out a warning to its citizens, leave Afghanistan as soon as possible. Will Taliban capture power by force or can they still be reined in? Can Afghanistan descent into chaos be arrested. That's our focus this evening on Debrief. First up, India carried out an evacuation mission from Mazari Sharif yesterday as the fighting intensified and reached the doorsteps of Afghanistan's fourth largest city. A special flight was arranged to pull out all of Indian personnel, diplomats from the consulate and Indian nationals in the area as well. This after India already brought back its diplomats from Kandahar consulate last month. The embassy in Kabul remains functional but India has clearly told all its citizens there, make arrangements and leave Afghanistan as soon as possible. Afghanistan is presently hell on earth. And the Taliban is blazing a trail of death and devastation across the country. Their latest target is Mazar-e-Sharif, the fourth largest city of Afghanistan with an estimated population of 5 lakh. The capital of the Balkh province, it is linked to several key cities like Kabul and Herat. And caught in the battle of Mazar-e-Sharif are several Indians, 50 of them, including diplomats, hastily evacuated by India to New Delhi in the wee hours of Wednesday morning, after having sounded this alert on Twitter. But the mission to rescue Indians from Afghanistan is far from over with 1,500 of them being engaged in different kinds of work in the war-ravaged nation. And the MEA, locked in a race against time, has come up with the latest advisory to Indians still stranded, which includes staying abreast with the availability of commercial flights and making immediate travel arrangements to return to India. Indian companies operating in Afghanistan have been directed to withdraw their Indian employees out of project sites at once before air travel gets discontinued. Indians themselves have been advised to register themselves at the embassy. Even members of the Indian media are asked to contact the embassy for a risk assessment of their assignments. Our embassy in Kabul and our consulates in Kandahar and Mazari Sharif are functional. We are, however, carefully monitoring the deteriorating uh, security situation in Afghanistan and its implications on the security and safety of Indian nationals in Afghanistan. Our responses uh, will be calibrated accordingly, depending on how the situation evolves. From Kuwait to Wuhan, evacuating its own stranded in war zones abroad has always been the priority of India's Ministry of External Affairs. But this time, there is a palpable sense of tension in South Bloc. Ritang Shubhattacharya for CNN News 18. So let's give you a sense now of how far and how fast the Taliban is advancing in Afghanistan. It's no longer some far-flung, inaccessible, sparsely populated areas that Taliban has taken control over. They're reaching for Afghanistan's heart, taking over several provincial capitals. Let's start with the corner where Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran meet. That's Nimroz, its capital. Zaranj has been taken over by the Taliban on the 6th of August. And this is the situation that currently exists in several of the other provincial capitals of Afghanistan. As we have pointed out, we are starting with the, the first one, which is Nimroz, which is at the south of Afghanistan, which has been taken over by the Taliban already. Their capital, uh, Zaranj, has been taken over on the 6th of August. And from there, let's move to the north now, Jawsjan, which is bordering Turkmenistan. That capital of Shebagan has also been taken over by the Taliban. This happened on the 7th of August. On the 8th, Sarepol, which is the capital of the province by the same name, has also been taken over by Taliban. And Kunduz, capital again, Kunduz itself, captured on the 8th of August. So you can see progressively they have taken over the provincial capitals. Now let's talk about Talokan, the capital of uh, Tahar, which has also been captured by the Taliban on the same day. 
The subsequent day on the 9th of August, Aibaka and its capital, Samangan, was also taken over by Taliban. So you're seeing this on the map of Afghanistan, the manner in which uh, the Taliban have been advancing. Pule Humri, the capital of Baglan, also captured by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Now, uh, in fact, there was intense fighting going on for Farah and the capital has now been taken over. This was captured on 10th August uh, and subsequently another one, the capital of uh, Fezabad, also taken over by the Taliban on the 10th. Meanwhile, here are the places now which we'll point out on the map where the war rages on. mazar -e sharif first of all, capital of Balkh. This is from where India has evacuated all its citizens because this is the fourth largest city in Afghanistan and uh, yesterday the Taliban was almost reaching its doorsteps. Herat now, the war rages on there as well in the capital of Herat. Meanwhile, Lashkarga is where we've seen intense fighting happening as far as Afghanistan is concerned. We've seen several visuals of people having been killed there as well, civilians having been killed. Lashkarga is where the war rages on in Helmand and Kandahar again. Kandahar has also seen intense fighting for the last several weeks. That also remains one of the areas which is extremely vulnerable at the moment. So this is now a comparison of the areas that Taliban has taken over. We are comparing it between April and August. What has been the progress of the Taliban as it rampages through Afghanistan. You can see the red patches there having increased over here. Taliban claim they've taken over 85% of the territory, but that's not the real assessment. The assessment is about 65% of the population could now be under the control of Taliban. Certainly a difficult situation there. Meanwhile, amidst this devastation in Afghanistan, America is being questioned on its troops pull out in this swift manner, leaving air capacity and intelligence capacity gaps that the Taliban have taken advantage of. Afghanistan has pointed a finger at the US for its unfashioned withdrawal, leaving the country vulnerable to a possible takeover by Taliban. But President Biden says he doesn't regret his decision. So has America only focused on its sole motive of leaving Afghanistan after 20 years? But has the war been left unfinished. The attack that triggered America's costliest and longest war yet. What began with airstrikes in 2001 ended in a teen peace treaty two decades later. Zalmay Khalilzad U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation and Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, political head of the Taliban, signed a peace deal on the 29th of February last year. The most significant aspect of this deal was the withdrawal of U.S. and NATO troops within 14 months of signing of the deal. But over a year later, there is nothing but chaos on the ground. The Taliban claims it has control over 85% of Afghan territory. Fighting is intensifying daily Several hundreds are being forced to flee the country. A war has been brewing post the US exit, but many believe Washington still has its head buried in the sand. There have been ceasefires. Uh, there was the US Taliban agreement, uh, which of course stipulated that the Taliban could not attack and would not attack American forces. Uh, that has not transpired uh, since the US Taliban agreement went into effect. Let's take a closer look at what were the terms of the peace deal between the US and the Taliban. First, ensuring and enforcing mechanisms to prevent the use of Afghan soil to foment terror against the United States. Second, the US had to share a timeline and guarantee the withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. Once the first two conditions are met, intra-Afghan dialogue will begin between the Taliban and the Afghan government and other stakeholders. The two sides will be expected to come to a consensus on a permanent ceasefire and the road ahead for the country. Talks between the Taliban and the government have hit a wall. One of the main sticking points for the stalemate is that the Taliban wants an interim authority to replace the government of President Ashraf Ghani and the immediate release of several thousand incarcerated Taliban combatants. 
This deal was signed when the Trump administration was in power. However, the Afghan government was completely sidelined during the talks between the US and the Taliban. At the same time, the US also signed a joint declaration with the Afghan government, a symbolic commitment to the Afghanistan government that the US is not abandoning it. US President Joe Biden reiterated that commitment to the Afghan people, but said he did not regret the pullout of US troops. We spent over a trillion dollars over 20 years. We trained and equipped with modern equipment over 300,000 Afghan forces. And Afghan leaders have to come together. I think they're beginning to realize they've got to come together politically at the top. And uh, but we're going to continue to keep our commitment. But I do not regret my decision. The future for the people of Afghanistan is uncertain and will depend on how the Taliban honors its commitments. The US has held up its end of the bargain. Now the onus lies on the Afghan leadership. Will they consolidate or will Afghanistan return to the 1996 to 2001 Taliban run Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan? With Natasha Menden, Anisya Kumar for CNN News 18. Now, this accusation has come from none other than the Afghan President Ashraf Ghani himself and from an international podium that Pakistan is fueling the chaos in his country. He accused Pakistan of pushing thousands of Taliban fighters into Afghanistan. Pakistan denies these charges, but the world points to the mounting evidence of Pakistan at play. This is not Afghanistan. This is a display of support for the Taliban in Quetta. The visuals adding up to the evidence that Taliban is being emboldened from across the border in Pakistan. Intelligence estimates indicate the influx of over 10,000 jihadi fighters from Pakistan and other places in the last month, as well as support. As the Afghan forces tried to launch an offensive against the Taliban in Spin Boldak two weeks ago, the injured Taliban fighters were being treated in Jilani Hospital in Quetta. Calls were also made in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to join the fight in Afghanistan with the Taliban. And a more serious allegation from the Afghan Vice President Amrullah Saleh. Pakistan Air Force has issued official warning to the Afghan Army and Air Force that any move to dislodge the Taliban from Spin Baldak area will be faced and repelled by the Pakistan Air Force. Pak Air Force is now providing close air support to Taliban in certain areas. A charge Pakistan denied. I can assure you that no country has tried harder to get Taliban on the dialogue table than Pakistan. Short of taking military action against Taliban in Pakistan, we have made every effort to get them on the dialogue table and to have a peaceful settlement there. To blame Pakistan for what is going on in Afghanistan, I feel is extremely unfair. Meanwhile, Pakistani security officials at the Chaman border crossing with Pakistan and Afghanistan say that Afghan Taliban have blocked the border between the two countries. According to the security officials, the Afghan Taliban brought concrete blocks on a crane and placed the blocks on the Afghan side of the road known as the zero point of the border. As the situation deteriorates, the Afghan citizens in urban areas came out on the streets to show that they will hold their ground against the Taliban, chanting, Allah is great, and that they won't give up just yet. With Manoj Gupta, Mahasiddiqui, CNN News 18. Let's get a sense of the ground situation now. CNN's chief international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, is now joining us from Kabul. Clarissa May, thanks for speaking with us. How safe, Clarissa, is Kabul from the threats of Taliban advancing into urban areas? We understand that the U.S. is contemplating a further drawdown from its embassy in Kabul. 
Yes, that's what we're hearing, that they are contemplating uh, pulling out more of their personnel here. This comes just after they urged all Americans to leave Afghanistan, and certainly, mm -hmm. Maha, that is not going to do anything for the situation on the ground here in terms of morale, which is at a very low ebb. Even though the capital here, Kabul, is relatively secure, there is a real sense that that could change, and it could change quickly. Nine provincial capitals now under the control of the Taliban. That's more than a quarter of the total provincial capitals across the country. Mm -hmm. We visited a number of other cities, Ghazni, Kandahar, which is Afghanistan's second largest city. They are completely surrounded by the Taliban. Lashkargah, Herat, I could go on. Mm -hmm. At least half the provincial capitals in this country are currently under threat. And so the very real fear here on the ground in Kabul is that the situation is unraveling so quickly mm -hmm. and that there isn't a plan yet in place for how to effectively take back some of this territory or at the very least slow down the Taliban's offensive. Hmm. Maha? Clarissa, Ambassador Khalil Zad is in Doha. Is there much expectation that he could push a ceasefire through? I think the expectations in Doha are very low at the moment, to be honest, Maha. And, and that's simply put because the Taliban is winning right now. The Taliban has all the leverage. They have all the cards to play. And because they think they can win this thing, they don't have the same level of incentive to sit down and really hash out a power sharing agreement, which would almost certainly necessitate them making major concessions. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. also doesn't have a huge amount of leverage anymore either. Because they're going to be done with their withdrawal in a matter of weeks, they're no longer in a position to really put that much pressure on the Taliban. They can say, listen, we can continue with these airstrikes, we can make your life difficult and painful on that front. But at this stage, I think the Taliban seems sort of resigned to accent that these airstrikes will continue. Right. And while they may be slowing down the mm -hmm. pace of the offensive somewhat, mm -hmm. they're certainly not stopping it in its tracks, Maha. Clarissa May, thanks for joining us with all those details from Kabul. With that, we're taking a very quick break. When we come back, a ground report by Clarissa Ward from Kandahar. Welcome back. As the fighting in Afghanistan intensifies, CNN's Clarissa Watt travels with Afghan soldiers into Kandahar as the Taliban militants try to take it over while U.S. troops withdraw from the country. On the road to Kandahar's front line, there is still civilian traffic, even as the Taliban inches deeper into the city. Afghan commandos have agreed to take us to one of their bases. This used to be a wedding hall, now it's the front line position. Most of the fighting here happens at night, but Taliban okay, so snipers are at work 24 hours a day. From snipers? Yes. The men tell us the Taliban are hiding in houses just 50 yards away from us. And they shoot from people's homes? They shoot yeah, from yeah, civilian yeah. They, you homes? See, you see, this is all civilians' homes. We cannot uh, uh, use, you know, the... Uh, big weapons, uh, the heavy weapons. It's been nearly a month since the Taliban penetrated Afghanistan's second largest city. Since then, these men haven't had a break. U.S. airstrikes only come in an emergency. The rest of the time, it's up to them to hold the line. We feel a little bit weak without U.S. airstrikes and ground support and equipment, he says. But this is our soil, and we have to defend it. Bombardment using heavy weapons. In a villa in the eastern part of the city, Kandahari lawmaker Gul Ahmed Kamin is hunkered down. In decades of war, he says he's never seen the fighting this bad. Millions of people in this city are waiting for when they will be killed, uh, when someone will kill them, uh, when their home will be destroyed, and it is happening every minute. Just spell out for me here, the Taliban is basically surrounding the entire city of Kandahar now. Is that correct? Definitely, yes. And so, where is there to go? Uh, nowhere. So there is uh, 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 only uh, two options, do or die. Do or die? Yes. And what does do look like? Uh, that is the thing to convince uh, different sites uh, to 
ceasefire, uh, to work on peace, uh, to convince them to not to fight, not to kill. But that is a tall order in a city where war has become part of everyday life. You can probably see there's a lot more cars on the road than there were previously, and that's because in just two minutes at 6 p.m., the cell phone network gets cut across the city, and that's when the fighting usually starts. Throughout the night, the sounds of gunfire and artillery pierce the darkness. Kandahar is the birthplace of the Taliban. They are intent on taking it back, and the government knows it cannot afford to lose it. By day, an eerie calm holds. The UN says more than 10,000 people are now displaced in this city. On the outskirts of town, we find 30 families camped out in an abandoned construction site. He's saying that none of these children have fathers. All of their fathers have been killed in the fighting. Back at the base, dust coats the chairs where wedding guests would normally sit. As the siege of Kandahar continues, life here is in limbo, with no end in sight. The world can't afford to be a mere spectator as the democratic gains of two decades in Afghanistan get squandered away within weeks. But the question is, how can the Taliban be stopped when it's increasingly clear their lofty words on gaining international legitimacy this time was nothing but a sham? That's it for today. See you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.